Welcome to tonight's launch of Inmedius Res, the student journal of creative writing and art produced by the incredible students and alumni of the Odyssey Project, Proyecto Odisea. I want to tell you about both Inmedius Res and Odyssey, and I'm so proud that Illinois Humanities is home to both of these things. The Odyssey Project is at the heart of our education programs and for two decades the odyssey project has provided classes in english and spanish from extraordinary faculty that enable income eligible adults to earn college credits by studying the humanities together okay so what is in medius res the phrase literally means in the middle which means this introduction is actually the preamble to the good stuff which i'm going to get to in Medias Res is when we enter a story right in the middle. Our characters, the plot, they're already in the thick of it. And tonight, that's what we get to do. We have the opportunity to jump into the action all together and to see through our protagonist's eyes, their ears, their hearts, as we have some of our Odyssey students share their work with us tonight. This year marks something remarkable, the 20th anniversary of the Odyssey Project at Illinois Humanities, and we're commemorating it by relaunching something very special, a publication of Odyssey students' humanities works appropriately entitled In Medias Res. This has only been published three times in the past, most recently in 2015, so tonight is a really big deal. I really want to thank Julia Rossi. She's a doctoral candidate at the University of Chicago. She took on the project of reviving in Medias Res and also brought it to life digitally as an experience. You're going to get to meet her in a minute, and I really encourage you to check out in Medias Res online. I have the pleasure of thanking every contributor to this project. Every reader of drafts, the editorial committee of instructors and alumni, we have terrific designers. It's Sarah Summers Design. Thank you to our video producer for tonight, Tony Santiago, and a very special heartfelt thanks to our director of teaching and learning, Becky Amato, who is a true champion of what tonight is all about, and not just tonight, but every single day on behalf of our Odyssey students. And of course, to Julia for the beautiful work you've done to bring us this celebration. I also want to thank a very special guest we have with us tonight, Sahar Mustafa, who is a brilliant Illinois writer. And thank you so much for sharing your work and sharing the stage with our own brilliant creative writers. Happy 20th anniversary, Odyssey, and congratulations to all of the contributors of Inmedius Res for your gorgeous, frank, compelling compendium. But most of all, thank you, because with this work, you're reigniting a hopeful effort that reminds us that every day we're neither at the beginning nor the end of our journey, but rather in Medius Res in the thick of it. Have a great evening and congratulations. Hello everyone at Odyssey. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Julia Rossi. I was an intern with Odyssey last year and I was able to get to know some of you um, and to help with the process of putting together this new issue of In Media Stress. I wanted to send out my enthusiastic congratulations to everyone who contributed to this journal whose beautiful work is incorporated here. Um, I'm thrilled to have had the chance to participate in this celebration of the Odyssey community. In this journal, we have poems, personal essays, short stories, visual art, um, such a wide array of kinds of work. And it's so dazzling to see it all come together in one journal. Um, I'm so excited to be able to celebrate with all of you and to see all of your hard work in print. Um, I did also want to give a quick plug for the digital companion to this journal, um, which you can find by following the QR code on the title page of the physical journal. This digital companion is more than just an online version of the journal. It's an interactive multimedia experience that gives us a different way to approach this collection of work. One of the most exciting things about it is that it incorporates a lot of maps, which you can zoom in on and play around with um, to really locate yourself in these stories. So I'd encourage you to check it out um, and scroll around and just have fun with it. This is an incredible journal. Both the print version and the digital companion are just so beautiful and exciting. And I'm so grateful that I was able to work with Odyssey last year. I enjoyed getting to know so many of you and seeing your creative processes at work 
as you developed your pieces for this collection. Congratulations again on this really remarkable achievement. Hello, I'm Sahar Mustafa, and I'm a native Chicago writer. I'm excited to be in this space and grateful to the Illinois Humanities for this invitation to join you in this wonderful reading. Congratulations on your publication. I feel particularly proud when I think back on my early experiences in writing and publishing. Almost two decades ago, I first found community and growth while publishing in literary journals and magazines. They were the first places to validate my fiction, to remind me when my confidence failed that my stories matter. In Media Race, to which you are all contributing, is an example of invaluable spaces. I hope you too will find affirmation and encouragement to declare yourselves writers without reservation. Take advantage of this time as emerging writers to take risks and explore your voice. Don't self-censor or write what you think others will read. Write what inspires, moves, and stuns you. You'll find an audience because you realize that you can't not write. That's an identity that helps you make meaning in a complicated, often volatile world. Invest in your craft and treat it as your life's work. Perhaps it's a second life like me, which I've cultivated alongside teaching. Remember that your writing deserves time and devotion, whatever that schedule might look like and is best for you. Find a writing group who can read you and will nurture your writing spirit. Practice self-care so that you can do this important work. We write to understand ourselves and each other, celebrating our shared humanity. I can't think of a more worthwhile occupation. And now your writing enters the world, leaving an impression that is far reaching, more than you imagine or can credit yourself with. Best wishes on telling your stories. I'm going to be reading from my novel, The Beauty of Your Face. And this is the chapter in which my main character, Afaf, is 10 years old in 1976, reflecting on her immigrant parents' past. Afaf's sister was born in 1959 in Mama's childhood house in Palestine. When they finally received sponsorship from his cousin, her father packed up his new family for America. He waited tables um, at a diner during the day and visited Chicago's Gold Coast nightclubs like the Pump Room, where Sinatra infamously had a private booth. Baba failed to persuade club owners to give him a chance. He was no Leonard Cohen or Johnny Cash. His old sung melancholic tunes, too exotic or oriental, as they called it. Folks like to dance around here, they told Baba, shaking their heads at his pot-bellied old. His luck was no better in the Southside blues joints. Some of the managers were fascinated by Baba's instrument, the downturned peg box, the way the notes on the downstroke bounced away when he transitioned to the upstroke. But in the end, you ain't singing in English, you ain't singing here, Baba recalls when Afaf climbs into his lap for stories of his musical life. Baba's parents were forced out of their home in Haifa in 1950. They had one hour to pack up all of their belongings while the Jewish settlers kept close guard, pointing their rifles at them. His mother tucked the key to the stone entrance of their stolen home in a pouch sewn inside her peasant dress, and they breathed in the sea for the last time. You could smell the salt of the sea from our window, Baba told Afaf. She wondered how it must have been for Baba to once have an entire sea and now merely a lake, though to Afaf. Lake Michigan appeared boundless during the summertime when Baba took them to the lakefront outside the Adler Planetarium to watch sailboats moving across the horizon. Baba was a young boy when his father left them with a family in the West Bank in search of work and a new home across the river in Jordan. They never heard from him again. His mother later died of a respiratory infection and he and his siblings were separated. Two sisters were taken to Al Khalil to live with a widowed aunt, and he and his older brother, Jamil, stayed behind with the foster family in Ramallah. While he attended school, Jamil apprenticed with a local blacksmith, hammering metal from early morning until the late afternoon prayer. The year Baba turned 13, his brother was kicked and trampled by a donkey on his way to the souk to barter goods for the blacksmith. 
Baba was all alone in the world. The foster family was kind, but they could not quell Baba's passion for music, a useless vocation. He cut school and spent time with a villager who taught him to play the oud. Blind Waji, Waji al Ami, procured a secondhand lute for Baba and trained his young fingers to strum and hold the, the strings. Was he born blind? Athef asks, her imagination stretching with faces and places of her father's first life. His second one began with Mama. La, la, Baba tells her. Waji was a member of a Royal British Orchestra in Jerusalem. He lost his sight in a terrible explosion during a riot. He kisses the top of Athaf's head, but he never stopped playing, mashallah. Not to be discouraged from all the rejections in Chicago, Baba enlisted a couple of fellow immigrants who worked at Dyer Plastic. Ziad, a Palestinian from a small neighboring village who could play a heart-fluttering May flute, and Amjad, an Egyptian percussionist who could seamlessly move between tabla and tambourine. They formed Baladna and played at Arabi weddings around the city. During the week, they lifted and drove pallets of resin at the plastics factory, carving out a new life for their young wives and their new American children. Adeth loved to look at the black and white photographs from a shoebox her mother stored in a hallway closet, their winter coats grazing the lid. They are pictures she thinks she knows by heart, but then a new detail emerges, like the way the feathery clouds obscure the sun, or how Baba's coat collar is turned up on one side. Her favorite is of Baba standing on the beach at the Dead Sea. He's wearing a pair of pressed slacks and a white button-down shirt. His hands are thrust deep into his pockets, and he's squinting at the camera, a smile dancing across his lips. My best friend Basim took that picture, he tells Athaf every time she holds it up for one of them to see. Poor boy died of cancer of the blood. Meskeen. Back in the old country, a young Baba honed his music while working at a mahmasa in Elvira, roasting watermelon and pumpkin seeds sold by the kilo. Athaf pulls out another dog-eared photograph. In it, her mother poses with a group of girls, their arms linked, sporting beehives and kohal rimmed eyes. Mama is the tallest, standing in the middle. I loved your, mo your mother's dress, Baba tells Athaf, tapping the photograph. You can't tell here, but it was a beautiful green mohman, velvet with lace down her back. It was the first time I saw your mother. But no photograph in the untidy pile in the shoebox could reveal the early turbulent periods of her parents' marriage. After Neda was born, Mama refused to have any more children until Baba had settled into a stable job and they could move out of his cousin's bungalow on 53rd and Fairfield Avenue. They constantly fought and Mama had threatened to return overseas. It was an empty threat. They could barely make rent, let alone acquire a plane ticket. When they could afford an apartment of their own, her mother conceived Atha seven years after Neda. Athef often wonders what sort of child might have come after Neda. If her parents had continued having children immediately after Neda was born in Palestine, who might exist between her older sister and Athef? Would she still have been born? It seemed unlikely to Athef when she watched Mama move around the apartment, a nervous energy causing her to spill glasses of milk and drop plates, their sound clattering down Athef's spine as they hit the floor. Mama is slow to smile at her and Majid, though her eyes light up whenever Neda is home. It was the two of them for so long. Athaf and Majid were like interlopers. Mama and Neda had been newcomers to this country, though Neda has no trace of an accent, no recollection of olive groves and herds of sheep. For seven years, her only daughter had filled the void of the loneliness in a new country. Athaf finds in the shoebox a Polaroid of Neda an olive-skinned chubby toddler, bare-chested and seated on a blanket spread over grass with the children of Baba's cousin with whom they'd lived. And another shows Mama holding Neda as she stands next to Baba at someone's birthday party, his arm lazily draped around her shoulders, balloons floating behind them. There's something in her mother's face that looks like tentative joy, not a full smile, but her green eyes twinkle with mirth. When Athaf arrived, Followed three years later by Majid, they were merely more mouths to feed. And I will end there. Thank you again for having me in this space. And congratulations on your wonderful publication. Best wishes. 
Hi, my name is Rita Alvarez, the daughter of Mexican immigrants who came to Chicago in 1958. I was born a couple of years later. I'm the youngest of 10 and I grew up, well, I was born and raised in steel mill country, United States steel, Republic steel, and Wisconsin steel surrounded us in the 60s and 70s and before that. Now, there are no more steel mills in my community, so this is what inspired me to write this poem called Broken Promises. I shudder to think about the water we drink, the air that we breathe, and the soil we seed. Once surrounded by industry, employing thousands, we basked in the soot, which stood pollution afoot. It put bread on our tables and money in our pockets. We died at young ages. Cancer hit us in stages. But then industry left us, ravaged and broke. Promises made to revitalize the hood. But all we got was stuck with crooks. Employing the tens instead of the thousands. The saviors came, proclaiming a change. Attend this meeting, speak up, clean up, volunteer, telling us all what we wanted to hear. They came, they took, they made their money, caring nothing for those remaining behind, polluting our air, our water, our soil, crumbling bridges, empty storefronts, vacant swaths of land. More taxes will save us. Recycle, they say. Meter your water. Pay for your bag. Outlaw plastic straws. These actions will make our city better. A band-aid to fix. A gaping wound. Pet coke. Manganese. Lead. Asthma. Autism. Cancer neurological concerns. I shudder to think about the water we drink, the air that we breathe, and the soil we seed. Thank you very much. My name is Rita Alvarez. My name is Larry Queen, and the title of my poem is Autobiographical Note Number Two. I was born in the shadows of the 63rd Street elevated train tracks. It was structured in my awareness for as long as I can remember. In the shadows, the streets of Woodlawn were as numerous as the stars in the sky, with names that evoked a pristine naturalistic retreat, like Stony Island, Greenwood, Kimbark, Kenwood, and Cottage Grove. Every block tells a different story here of life in the shadows. The sound of the passing train formed the background of my coming of age. It laced its way into the cacophony of sounds that populate these shadows like a requiem to its own everlasting. It echoes the ebb and flow of Lake Michigan in perfect unison. For a long time, the train dictated all of my arrivals and all my departures. Hi, my name is Anna Mangahas and I'm reading excerpts from Anna's Atlas. 1852 West 19th Street. National Museum of Mexican Art. It's the first time I remember seeing brown-skinned people depicted in art. Previously, I had only been to the Art Institute on field trips. Once this happened, I craved and looked for brown-skinned representation wherever I could. 1200 West Harrison, University of Illinois at Chicago. 
I took Latino cultural studies, multi-ethnic literature, and intro to women's studies. The only classes I took seriously there. My mind is further cracked open as I read Maxine Hong Kingston, Gloria Enzel Dua, and Audre Lorde, and so many other important foundational works. 1301 Gilman, Berkeley, California, and 401 Jones Avenue, Brookfield Elementary in Oakland, California. I'm in my own one bedroom apartment working two jobs. During the day, I'm a reading buddy or a literacy tutor, also my favorite job ever, with 10 first graders at Brookfield Elementary. A minimum wage job through AmeriCorps and I'm on a team with nine other people. In the evenings, I'm shelving books at the Berkeley Public Library. Proposition 187 polarizes me. Supporters of Prop 187 wanted to deny healthcare, education, and other services to undocumented immigrants. People that look like my family. It's very clearly BS to me um, to deny anyone healthcare and education. I also saw income inequality in very clear ways. I remember visiting a Berkeley Hills home that had six bedrooms and three bathrooms. And meanwhile, Isaiah, one of my first grade reading buddies had to share a toothbrush with his brother. Rosemont, Illinois. I'm back in Chicago after AmeriCorps and my Oakland raised boyfriend at the time, also my son's father joins me. He's driving me to my job at United Airlines. We're stopped by the police, no good reason. This only, only happens when he's driving. And yes, he's a black guy. Each time we shake our heads and he half jokingly, half seriously says, why didn't you give me my white guy driving mask, babe? 5400 North St. Louis, Northeastern Illinois University. 6700 North Greenview, Kelmer Elementary. I almost become a Chicago public school teacher. Student teaching was so hard. Even with incredible support from Grow Your Own, a program that supported people of color to become teachers and really encouraging professors and CPS teachers, I really struggled. I couldn't name the ways how then and even now it feels hard to explain. Even in this fuzziness, I clearly felt in my gut that CPS would have eaten me up. The specter of cultural racism, paternalism, and white supremacy lived in a classroom that would only bolster the school to prison pipeline. I just knew I couldn't do it. After student teaching, I was scared to be a teacher. 7345 North Washtenaw, Rogers Phillip Park. My 11 year old son is helping me paint the soccer field lines as part of our volunteer commitment to his AYSO soccer league. He has a spray can of field paint in his hand and is ahead of me by two large soccer fields. He's painting just the corners of the field, and I watch as a police officer parks his car, gets out of the car, walks across the field to where my son is spraying the grass. I wanna run over, but I don't because who runs towards a police officer? I watch the officer talk to my son. My son shows him the can of spray paint and hands it to the officer. The officer returns it. My son points to me walking over from two fields away. I curse my short legs. The officer waves at me, I wave back. The officer walks away from my son, and when I finally get to my son, I ask my son what the officer talked to him about. My son very calmly, plainly says, he thought I was doing graffiti on the ground. I ask how the interaction went, and my son shrugs his shoulders and says, it was normal. I let him know I'm glad it was normal. Weeks later, I decide to tell him how scared I was when I watched the officer walking towards him. 125 South Clark, Illinois Humanities Council Park. After a decade since taking the first Odyssey Project classes, I returned to finally take their second year courses to obtain the final six credits I need to graduate from college. It's way better than my classes at Northeastern for so many reasons. It felt as exciting as my first college classes at UIC. I managed to complete my assignments and I'm able to graduate from Northeastern with a degree in interdisciplinary studies. I don't feel like such a jerk telling my son that finishing college is important now. Hello, my name is Lucia Bruman. I am part of the Project Odisea in Espanol. Ignorancia, pasos que guían. Pasos que guían al ralenti, vacíos de deseo. Equipaje lleno de historia viva, nostalgia y de ser. Añoranzas, gozos, memoria. Ignorancia con la vista corta. Nubla el destino. La mano sobre el hombro que detiene e impide el futuro. Bestia llena de insignias que condena la esperanza e identidad. Conduce a la ignorancia. Que extingue. Que aniquila. Y esclaviza. 
mutismo que observa como del árbol caído se hace leña. Giros con tiempo indefinido. Inmigración entorpecida. Bifurcación forzada. Esperanza en luto. Hello, Odyssey and Beyond. My name is Chamberlain Clark, and I'm going to read to you a uh, poem that I wrote entitled Aftermath. It, um, it's definitely uh, talking about, uh, it definitely touches on what's going on right now, what's been going on for a while, but I guess in a way it's also a call to action or a warning because just when we think that we don't have responsibility in a certain situation that occurs when we're not there, in fact, we have all the responsibility, especially if we want things to change, if we want the negative to change anyway. Outside of a late evening window, a stirring figure was reaching to leave a small puddle on the ground. There was a cry before touching the phone. Potential questions were long gone. No follow-up until the streets were common on rumor. Because of loose lips, there had been a mother, a job, and a girlfriend. Much talk of tragedy while shaking the head. But in silence, the creator was praised because it was not you. In a short time, the puddle dries into a permanent shrine. In memory of the time, when everyone spoke without saying a word. Thank you. Me llamo Isis Macer y mi obra es Sueños de un Souvenir. Me llamaron así en honor a una diosa egipcia. Sin embargo, fue la tierra azteca la que me vio nacer. Esa tierra influenciada por españoles, portugueses, franceses, alemanes y demás culturas hicieron que mis imaginación se desarrollara a través de historias y cuentos que yo me contaba. Pero fue hasta que mi padre me trajo un souvenir de algún lugar en donde decía Illinois. Aún yo no sabía de qué se trataba. Era una casualidad o una causalidad lo que yo estaba por recibir. Eh, mi obra no se trata acerca de mí. La obra se trata acerca de de ese lugar al que llamamos hogar. Y me gustaría que compartir un extracto de, de esta obra. Eh, ustedes la pueden leer en la página 33 de Inmediatas. Somos memorias creadas por la sabiduría de las experiencias, circunstancias y casualidades. Así, viendo las cosas como son en realidad, buscamos la realización, la tranquilidad, la transformación y el cambio de nuestra realidad. Esas influencias, esa cotidianidad, esos sueños ajenos, terminan siendo la realidad a un sueño que nos inspira a caminar en la búsqueda de ese sueño que podremos llamar hogar. Al buscar la materialización de un sueño, es a través y solo por medio de la motivación de nuestros pensamientos que nos hará inspirar y transformar lo que se es o se posiciona dentro de nuestro sueño, siendo nosotros mismos los responsables de la realidad que nos rodea y en la cual vivimos. El hogar que hemos hecho nuestro sueño ha sido conformado desde ese despertar de conciencia en la primavera de la conformación de nuestro ser. Si una pequeña niña hubiera creído en las casualidades que se presentaron en su vida, habría creído y confiado en todos sus sueños por realizar y así, por mera curiosidad, diseñaría su camino al sueño que tenía por disfrutar. Pero fue solo en ese justo momento de casualidad en el que adquirió de las manos del padre un souvenir de lejanas tierras, una bolsa de forma circular en color amarillo canario con un borde ribeteado y cierre en color rojo. Al costado, unas letras que sin ningún significado aún, que rezaba esa palabra desconocida y llena de enigma. 
venía a su mente, le daba vuelta, la leía y releía, una y otra vez, repitiéndose, ¿qué será? Y no es. This place, this time, by me, Kathy Fitzgerald. I am loving life right now, sometimes not so much. When I was young and only interested in fun, uncertain of the future, uninterested in the past, never knowing what would last, years have passed, so slow, so fast. I look to the future and cherish the past, voraciously devouring everything life has to offer this old soul, a soul not interested in regrets, looking towards the next 20 years, consuming the past, listening intently to Plato, Socrates, and Dante, all the parables, amazing plights. I am loving life right now. Hello, everyone. My name is Juan Lopez, and I want to say thank you to the In Media's Rest, a journal of the Odyssey Project. Then, I want to say thank you to the Illinois Humanities for giving me the opportunity to share with you, Grillos, my own short story. Hola a todos, ¿cómo están? Mi nombre es Juanjo López y quiero agradecerle a la revista del Proyecto Odisea y al Illinois Humanity la oportunidad que me dan de poder compartir con ustedes un cuento corto de mi autoría titulado Grillos. Era en la sala de la casa del señor Gamborro. El reloj casi mordía a las 3 de la mañana. Tic, toc, tic, toc. La hora del umbral. Era un reloj de esos marca Majestic en forma de sol. Tenía unos cuantos lustros colgados en la pared del pasillo que le da la mano agrietada a la sala. El refrigerador del cuarto contiguo que estaba habilitado como cocina, de pronto se quedó mudo, cansado de hacer ruido parecido al de un tractor de granja. El enclenque motor viejo por fin se tomó un descanso. Poco después, la atmósfera se llenó de un silencio sordo. Y ahora, solo se escuchaban los grillos que daban la impresión de estar en grupos amontonados para poder entrar al concierto de un artista de moda. Desde el exterior se podía percibir el desenfreno y el éxtasis que reinaba en el interior. Cada vez eran malos que ya pasados de copas, desentonaban su canto. Cuando volé la habana, valga medio. ¿sí? <risa> Llegó borracho, borracho, por tu maldito amor. <risa> y se confunden con el punchis punchis de bocinas y subwoofers. A veces parece que reñían por diversión. Yo creo que... <risa> por la compañía de alguna grilla con cintura pequeña, voluptuosa, de esas que seguro bailaban pomposas. Dos carros que pasaban por allá afuera le pusieron la cereza al pastel. Iban haciendo una combinación de música y estruendos, como cuando tronaban los transformadores de luz allá en el barrio de San Cris. <ríe> ¿Sí? ¿De veras? Me acuerdo que cuando era niño... Cada que tocaban los grupos musicales de la colonia en plenas fiestas parroquiales, había una sobrecarga de electricidad. Eso no podía faltar. Parece que fue ayer. ¿Cómo olvidarlo? Se oía el tronido y hasta el eco de los cables chillando junto con el griterío de la gente. Parecían que venían de detrás del silencio. Y los músicos, allá, en la tarima eran como cantar de los grillos entre murmullos burlones. Pues entre el ruido y la velocidad de los dos carros que pasaron afuera, 
Solo quedaba un hueco profundo y sórdido. ¡Como de lamentos! Y si a esto le agregamos que el sistema de calefacción también se activó, a lo lejos se distinguía con las orejas medio empolvadas el ruido de una secadora de ropa. También se oía y se sentía casi parpadeando un cielo que jamás fue así. Greetings, it's Jacqueline Andrews. I am the coordinator for the South Side for the Odyssey Project. I just want to wish you all a big congratulations on your publication in Medias Res. It is a major accomplishment and just know that I am so proud of you and it was great to work with some of you and to see your work. Um, you should be proud of yourselves as well. Congratulations. Hey y'all, it's E. Congratulations to all the Odyssey alums for being published in this edition of Inmedi Res. Um, I feel particularly lucky that I got to read some of these pieces for Odyssey Project classes. Um, I just always love the opportunity to read Odyssey Project writing. Um, its depth of expression is always so powerful to read, so I look forward to reading more and congratulations again. Congratulations, Immediate Stress contributors. And happy to be 20th anniversary Odyssey Project. Hi everybody, this is Becky Yamato. I just wanted to chime in with everyone else and congratulate all of the contributors to Medias Res um, and all of the people who worked so hard to produce this beautiful journal this year. Um, I know it was a massive team effort and also individual journey for everyone who produced uh, poetry, essays, stories, and visual work for us. So thank you for all of that. And thanks for making Odyssey look so good. Congratulations.